This meeting is being recorded. Okay. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. I think we'll just give maybe a few more seconds for everyone to connect. Okay. Um, again, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, Thank you all for attending this uh, session of Catalyzing Change Week on Accelerating Social Economy. Uh, my name is Frederick Bailey. I'm an executive board member at SOS Group, uh, which is Europe's first company devoted to social and societal uh, change. And uh, I will be moderating this uh, session today um, with five uh, amazing speakers, and I will introduce them later on. Um, just a few words uh, before we start the session. Uh, obviously, this session is being recording. You just heard that. Um, we will ask you also to write your question. And I hope you can still hear me because I can't see you anymore and my connection is really poor. So I will turn off my camera just for a sec. Um, there is also a translation uh, uh, app which is available, and I don't know if Wordly Link, actually, which is being shown to you, I believe. Okay, again, my connection is very poor. Please bear with me. I'm very sorry about this. Uh, so, uh, as you can see here, you can get the translation written uh, or audio translation in different languages. So, please do not hesitate to, to use it. Um, and again, if you have any issues, uh, please use the chat. All right. Um, so we shall get started. Um, and I will soon introduce our, our speakers. But before that, uh, if you'd allow me a few, a few words of introduction. Uh, OK, sorry. Let's go through the, through the different slides before that then. Okay, so keep your video on if possible, show your name, unmute when you speak, you're all used to that, I'm sure, and if you have any questions, then use the chat again. Okay. Um, okay, everyone. Hello again for, for, for the latecomers. Um, again, I'm Frederick Bailey, I'll be moderating this session. Faced with the health crisis that has shaken the world uh, for more than two years, faced with the ecological crisis that is more threatening every day, and in the face of armed conflicts which push millions of people to flee their countries, the actions of social entrepreneurs and innovators have never seemed so necessary. The COVID-19 uh, pandemic has accentuated the precariousness and isolation of many people around the world, and it has revealed um, it has revealed some of our economic and social weaknesses. Social entrepreneurs and innovators and systems catalysts, as we like to call them at Catalyst 2030, um, on the front line during this crisis, subjected to an intense, often grueling pace, shown with their courage and efficiency. Everywhere initiative has been born, bringing new solutions, and uh, building a more united, more committed, and more solid society. The social economy has demonstrated the relevance of its model. Yet, despite significant progress in many countries, the establishment of an enabling institutional and policy environment for the social economy remains a real challenge. Partnerships with the private sector are still too few, and the social economy is yet to be fully recognized for all it's worth. But guess what? We now have good reasons to hope for positive changes in this respect. And today we will discuss with our uh, five panelists the recent or foreseeable advances, both at local, regional, and international levels, in terms of, again, institu institutional and policy environment and recognition of the social and solidarity economy as a lever for development. 
So to discuss these topics with, with us today, I'm happy to introduce our five panelists. Um, Mrs. Maravilla Cespin, you are the Director General for Social Economy at the Spanish Ministry of Labor and Social Economy, welcome. Uh, Mr. Thomas Boisson, you're the head of Impact Investing Social and Solidarity Based Economy Unit at the French Ministry of Economy, Finance and Recovery. Welcome back. Um, Mr. Vig van Vuren, who most of you know, is uh, the chair of the UN Kuchava Mesu, uh, you're president of the Romanian Federation of Integration Enterprises and president of Atelier Fara from Tiare, a Romanian. Uh, social enterprise, social enterprise. Sorry, and François Bonici, uh, whom we all also uh, all know, is the head of the Schwab Foundation for Social Entrepreneurship. François, I would like to start with you. Um, you will soon publish a comprehensive report on the social economy, uh, in which you explain that two shifts are needed to unlock the potential of the social economy. So to set the stage. Um, for this discussion and for the first part of this is, uh, the, of the discussion, can you share with us uh, in a few minutes some of the main insights from your report, starting maybe with a focus on the first shift that is needed in terms of building a more supportive ecosystem? Uh, merci, Fred, and, and thank you so much. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Firstly, at Headlining Change Week, my uh, first speaking session of a busy week, but also... Um, to be on this, I think, esteemed panel, uh, and I had uh, felt that you know many of these other panelists have been uh, working on this topic for, for for a long time. So perhaps you know I'll do what you said, Fred, and try to help set the scene. For I think uh, you know, so I'm I'm at the Schwab Foundation for 20 years. We've been building a community of social entrepreneurs. I also work uh, as head of social innovation at the World Economic Forum, um, which is clearly. Uh, an international organization focused on public-private cooperation uh, and is interested in the global and influencing the global agenda. Uh, and so the purpose of this report, you know, I, it's, it's not necessarily saying anything new that many of the actors that will speak and uh, will follow don't know about in terms of what uh, the social economy is uh, and offers, but what I think we are trying to support and bring is a, a recognition of its existing current scope scale, but also its potential as a sector, as a cross-cutting sector, and also its potential in influencing uh, other actors. Uh, and so I think we're at a really interesting momentum point with significant institutions, as well as significant networks of social economy actors coming together to really have a collective voice around you know, consolidating around what is the social economy and why we need more of it. And it's clear we've come out of a very difficult time of a pandemic around the world of ongoing climate crisis and everything everyone knows about recognizing that unless we have intentionality around inclusion unless we have intentionality around the people who drive sustainable development uh, we will have perhaps a green economy perhaps we will have a digital economy but we will have one that benefits the same actors that benefit today from today's current economy and i think that's the kind of driving force around why all of these actors are around the table. So very quickly, you asked about the report, it's called Unlocking the Social Economy. It's geared towards a mainstream audience. It's not a technical document you know, that OECD and ILO and many others have, have put out, but it builds on those to try to represent to uh, the, uh, the world and to, I guess, governments that are interested and in looking at uh, um, how they can build more inclusive economies to think about uh, and look at examples of where the social economy is taking off uh, and is having real impact. Um, so very quickly, we kind of look towards the, the, the need to recognize and build new frameworks, to build understanding, um, to uh, create incentives for funding and investment, to expand education and research, to look at public and private procurement channels, uh, to collect and make visible social impact data. So you know, very quickly, very big, broad categories, but I think this is what many of, of this panel are working on. But it requires you know, a partnership between uh, government actors, uh, you know, a, a academics, and of course, uh, practitioners okay, themselves to really shape and build this. Okay. The, the, the second piece I spoke about, and maybe I'll stop there and I'll, uh, we can come back to it later, is that what we 
the session is called accelerating the social economy. We want to accelerate it, but we also want to see it beyond its own purpose and in what it offers the mainstream economy. And I think that's a really important second shift that we need to be seeing. So first we need to strengthen the social economy and at the same time, we need to influence how, how business operates. We need yes. to take these models and, 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 uh, and, and understand how those can be adopted, how those can be partnered with. I'll leave it there. Yeah, thank, thank you, Francois, and we'll, we'll definitely get back to you on this second shift. Um, but before we do, I think what we want to stress today is the importance indeed of the first shift around um, having more um, uh, conducive uh, ecosystems. And, and uh, to touch a little more on this topic, I would like uh, now to ask you, Maravillas, um, uh, a few questions. Uh, Spain, which you represent today, was the first, and correct me if I'm wrong, but was the first European country to enact a law on the social economy concept in 2011 uh, with the aim of recognizing and supporting the social economy as a separate economic sector. However, only in 2015 did the government set priorities for its, its implementation and the Ministry of Labor and Social Economy uh, was created in 2020. Uh, what were the main challenges and obstacles uh, to fully implement this strategy? And what are your current uh, priorities um, in Spain and as the Spanish government? Muy buenas tardes y muchísimas gracias por, por vuestra invitación y la oportunidad de compartir este momento con vosotros y vosotras. Bien, respondiendo a, a, la, a, a la cuestión planteada, eh, tenemos que reconocer que en España sí existe un ecosistema eh, de economía social muy consolidado, gracias sobre todo al esfuerzo de las personas, de las organizaciones y de las empresas que durante décadas han estado trabajando para, para generar este ecosistema. A ello ha acompañado, como muy bien has indicado en tu introducción, un marco jurídico adecuado, esa ley del año 2011, y eh, una estrategia, un plan estratégico eh, plurianual que, que ha reforzado ese ecosistema. No obstante, eh, dadas las circunstancias y, dando, y dado el diagnóstico que hemos hecho, es necesario consolidar e impulsar algunas transformaciones para conseguir que todo el potencial transformador de ese ecosistema se pueda desarrollar. ¿Y cómo, cómo lo estamos haciendo? ¿Con qué finalidad? Con la finalidad de que la economía social consiga transformar hacer más democrática la propia economía, hacerla más inclusiva, eh, más apegada a los territorios, porque es en los territorios donde debemos establecer nuestras raíces para, para alcanzar las soluciones que buscamos y generando un tejido empresarial mucho más perdurable en el tiempo. Para ello tenemos que afrontar los, los, al menos tres retos. Eh, el reto de la visibilidad, conseguir trascender... Eh, los espacios en los que entre nosotros nos entendemos porque tenemos un lenguaje común y alcanzar a la ciudadanía, ese es uno de los, de los objetivos. Por eso el Ministerio, ya con su propio nombre, Ministerio de Trabajo y Economía Social, asume un compromiso eh, firme para visibilizar la economía social y ha llevado a cabo algunas medidas y llevamos a cabo unas medidas dirigidas a, a trascender, a comunicar a llegar a la ciudadanía, entre ellas la creación de la capitalidad española de la economía social que va circulando eh, desde Toledo, Teruel, distintas regiones de, de la península ibérica para visibilizar y hacer más cercano lo que ya es cercano para los ciudadanos, la economía social. El segundo reto sería el acceso a la financiación y para ello lo que hemos hecho es ampliar el presupuesto de nuestras convocatorias anuales de ayuda a las actividades de la economía social y de ayuda al funcionamiento de las organizaciones que representan la economía social. También estamos garantizando el acceso de, la, de las entidades de la economía social a los fondos Next Generation a través de un plan integral de economía social que apunta a cinco de las líneas que hemos identificado durante estos dos años para impulsar efectivamente ese poder transformador y en tercer lugar, el, eh, hemos incorporado este, este plan integral en una herramienta estratégica que se denomina Plan Estratégico de Recuperación, Transformación y Resiliencia centrado en la economía social y en la economía de los cuidados. Lo más cercano a las personas, la atención a la propia persona 
y al entorno en el que se desarrolla. Y la tercera cuestión, el tercer reto es remover obstáculos legales que impidan fluir adecuadamente en este momento a las entidades de la economía social. Por eso estamos ahora mismo reformando la ley de cooperativas, la ley de empresas de inserción y el marco conjunto de estas leyes que es la ley de economía social en su décimo aniversario para actualizarla y ajustar pequeños ajustes que permitan mejorar su funcionamiento. Thank you, thank you very much, Maravillas, and we will uh, we'll get back to you for, for more on this. But uh, same question for you, Thomas. Uh, welcome back. You were um, kind enough uh, to step in yesterday for the opening ceremony uh, and to represent the French government since we were at, uh, uh, in between two governments, so to speak. So uh, the, the French minister was unable to, to attend the, the opening ceremony. Um, you've played a key role in the drafting and adoption of the 2014 law on social and solidarity economy in France. What is the gain that the French experience of this law allows to draw in the preparation of similar exercise for both for other countries, because we're here also to inspire other countries uh, to, to take action towards, again, more recognition and, and a law, and also internationally. Uh, thank you, Frédéric. First, uh, to say that uh, my, my, my role was quite modest, so, so not to, uh, to <laughs> put it uh, more than it is. Now, what I want to say is, uh, is uh, that it is very exciting to think that a growing number of countries are strongly committed to reaching a, a UN resolution on the social and solidarity based economy. And this is very, very good news. Uh, and we are, we are happy for this. So sharing experience on, on the, what uh, happened and what experience we got uh, at the national scene is of course of a great value. Uh, Maravillas uh, uh, explained, uh, we will try also to, to share and explain, and I do this now. So uh, maybe I, don't, I, I won't be very long because uh, we have other subjects that we want to develop uh, later on, but uh, let's say the philosophy, which is in my view quite important. At, at this point of the discussion, uh, uh, and reflection, um, I want to say something like an image and something concrete. You know that France is a country, the history of which borrow from Catholicism and Protestantism. You will say to me, what is it about? You will understand very quickly. Two, comple two complementary ways of building legitimacy, legitimacy by, by the purity of faith and legitimacy by the efficiency of the actions. So let's say that the French law on the solidarity uh, based economy and social economy seeks inspiration on both sides of legitimacy building. On the one hand, let's say that even if the company statutes, that is the form of association, mutual companies, etc., foundations, can probably not be the ultimate goal, we strongly believe that they serve very useful objectives and constitute efficient guarantees. And so this is one of the side of the philosophy that the French law and SSE uh, pursues. But on the other hand, defining everything against impact will definitely not protect against the risk of social washing or green washing, of course. But who will argue in 2022 that having a look on impact and outcomes if, is of, of, of no value at all. And so this is this sort of dialectic, this is this sort of tension, constructive tension that the SSC, uh, the SSC law, uh, French law of, of 2014, uh, tried to reconcile. And then two very short sentences as a, a, a conclusion. We believe that the development of SSC around the world would strongly benefit from the development of a coherent and aligned public policies in each country. And everybody knows that to make public policies work, we need framework definitions. This is the beginning of the story, not the end of the story. And the other main idea is that uh, adopting an international framework with the ILO, happy to see Vic here, the OECD, the UN, is a, a necessary uh, a step to gradually build a common understanding. So this is what I wanted to share with you. Thank you, Thomas. And obviously, we'll we'll get back to this uh, to this very important point with uh, with you and Maravillas and 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 Vic and everyone uh, just a bit later. But before we do that, uh, we've heard from two uh, experiences in Europe from two governments. Uh, I would now 
like to ask you, Ankucha, uh, being a, a practitioner, so you're on the ground, and it's important that we also hear the voice of practitioners here. Um, your country, Romania, adopted uh, in 2015 a framework law on social and solidarity economy. What is your view, uh, again, as a practitioner uh, and an advocate uh, on the progress made possible by this law, uh, but also on its on its limits, or maybe even shortcomings. Yes, uh, indeed. Uh, this law was the end of a struggle. It actually debates lasted for a few years because um, it, the, the law was actually a discovery of a new concept in our country. This was a, a discovery of the social economic concepts, the types of organizations and the common features of this uh, and the whole idea of a, a whole sector. Uh, and um, of course, this is why the process was not so easy. And it ended up uh, with, uh, you know, a kind of uh, a compromise between uh, the, the social economy concept and the new social enterprise concept. And it was very much influenced uh, uh, also by the international uh, debates. It's interesting how these uh, international debates can have an impact at national level. Because for instance, um, shouldn't have been the social business initiative of the European Union, uh, the, maybe the traditional social economy concept would have prevailed. So now we have to live in between these two worlds with a compromise which in, has very little practical um, effect, unfortunately. So this law was uh, uh, just to recognize the existence of a sector. Uh, not the, all the public policies that have to support and create uh, the ecosystem are still lagging behind and there is a lot of learning to be and sharing of good practices to happen uh, in a context in which traditional actors don't perceive themselves cooperatives and credit unions uh, and uh, mutuals don't perceive themselves as big a sector as, a, as, as such. So I, we share this, I think, with other former communist countries, which have been through this um, uh, this, uh, let's say, interruption, historical interruption in types of institutions. And anyway, it's, I welcome the initiative of UN very much so. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, I would also welcome uh, alignment with the European Union uh, action plan and policies. Thank you, Ankucha. And at, at this point and at this stage, I would like also to ask uh, participants uh, who would like to share their experience uh, in in their own countries uh, in terms of maybe uh, laws that have been adopted or are being uh, uh, drafted at the moment uh, to please to, uh, not hesitate uh, to write in the chat and we'll give you an opportunity also to, to give your own testimony towards the end. Um, now, Thomas, um, I don't know if you're, yes, you're here. Uh, during the opening session yesterday of uh, Catalyzing Change Week, you shared some of the insights on how France supports and promotes uh, social economy internationally, mostly through Pact for the Pact for Impact Alliance. Could you elaborate a little more on how this alliance differs from other, say, multi multilateral initiatives and tell us what are the, the French ambitions to develop it? Uh, yes, Frédéric. Uh, Pact for Impact is a global alliance initiated by France, but uh, put at a uh, common uh, house for, for, for all who want to participate in, in it. Uh, it was initiated in 2019 and dedicated to the support uh, and recognition, promotion of uh, social and solidarity-based economy. The initiative came about is in response to, let's say, two main observations and analysis. First, um, as I tried to expand it uh, during the panel introduced by Princess uh, Mabel Forentia, our national experience in France revealed an important point, which is the following. SSE, so social and uh, solidarity based economy, in our view, possess some kind of magical powers, so to say, in terms of uh, innovative capacity, and capacity to create and maintain inclusive jobs on the territory. 
However, these magics only operate, in our view, at a large scale under the condition of correct, uh, let's say, relevant, appropriate support coordination at different scales. Local, of course, but also national due to the interactions with the public authorities that I mentioned uh, right now, and also international and multilateral, because, because most of the time, uh, interna uh, SSC actors, SSC uh, entities, they uh, operate with complexity. So this needs a coordination and sometimes internationally and very often internationally and very often all at the same time. So in our view, this is the main reason why the visibility of SSC at the international level should be reinforced in order to enable and maintain uh, its, uh, let's say, economic reality, of course, but also its capacity to innovate and to uh, put uh, innovative responses to, to contemporary challenges. The second reason for this uh, is that uh, existing initial, uh, international initiatives, of course, meet some, some needs to support the SSE, such as creating a platform of dialogue or gathering both private and public stakeholders uh, in the same place uh, uh, to develop a systemic approach. But we believe that there's still a need uh, for comprehensive, integrated and extensive approach of the uh, of the SSE. So Pact for Impact is indeed, uh, is imagine, is, is thought uh, as a global alliance that brings together governments, local and regional authorities, international institutions, uh, of course, the SSC actors, companies, networks, organizations, academics, investors. It's an open public-private diplomatic initiative headed by a permanent uh, secretariat that we uh, were happy to, to support uh, with, uh, with means, but which uh, can be, of course, uh, put at the disposition to all participants with three per particular ambitions. The first one is sharing experience, very important. Promote model solution innovations by practice. Uh, the second ambition is that the network shall make proposals that public institutions can, can take on board. It's not only uh, having the uh, governments discussing together or international organizations discussing together, or uh, let's say private actors, SSC organizations uh, elaborating schemes. It's both working together uh, and receiving proposals. And the third ambition, uh, what do we do with these proposals, is that uh, it should also act as a catalyst for change with an operational roadmap. So this is quite important. We have landmarks for uh, putting into reality, uh, into the international political agenda, uh, recognition of the SSC at the global level. And this recognition is a precondition, a very, very important precondition to the success of, of the ambitions. So this third ambition has reached quite a strong level intensity since the second half of 2021 in the context of several important international initiatives. Commission, European Commission Action Plan for the Social Economy, which is quite concrete. Uh, OECD recommendation on SSE, international labor uh, conference discussion, which is occurring in June. I'm sure that Vic will uh, talk about this. Act for Impact is committed to contributing to this momentum. And uh, so we hosted in Paris uh, an international event on March the 4th to plan uh, the objectives of this alliance in 2022 and 23, with more than 150 participants from 50 countries, ranging for, from, from all continents. This ambition of the members of the alliance has resulted in a release manifesto and a clear priority in 2002 and 2003 collectively bring resolution at the UN level. This is uh, our skyline, let's say, for, for, for the next, uh, the upcoming month. Quite an ambitious subject, of course, but uh, very much necessary, as I said, to have SSC recognized properly. The Permanent Secretariat of the Alliance is now working actively on the uh, diplomatic administrative process to put uh, the SSC on the agenda on the, on the forthcoming UN assembly in close connection with the relevant uh, chanceries and permanent representation in New York. Uh, the Secretariat can rely on the uh, excellent job done by the UN Task Force on SEC and its team, which is precisely a clear uh, illustration of the benefits of uh, Pact for Impact, uh, Pact for Impact uh, collectively. Uh, and last, but not least, because it helps, uh, if it's not the only uh, obstacle, it helps, the, the, the Secretariat will also issue a lead uh, 
fundraising campaign, in particular in, in, in the direction of uh, relevant enterprises to support this very important initiative and the others that are to come. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Um, I see we have some interesting comments and questions in the chat. Uh, and thank you for that. We'll try and get to them towards the end of the session. But uh, before we do, I would now like to turn to Vic. Uh, and indeed, uh, Thomas mentioned some of the initiatives and, and, and the work that you're, that, you, that you're doing as chairman of the UN Task Force and director of enterprises department at uh, the uh, International Labour Organization. You're obviously at the center of this uh, multilateral stage. And quite a, quite a great deal uh, is happening this year. Uh, we have good reasons to believe that a resolution could be presented uh, by a group of countries to the UN for the recognition of the SSE. Can you tell us about this whole process, where we stand, who's contributing, uh, uh, what the schedule is, and, and what is left uh, for us all to do uh, here as, again, uh, Catalyst for Change? Thank you. Um, you know, one needs to just understand why there's importance for this resolution. And just briefly on that, you know, we've, we've got the, we've come through this pandemic. We're now in the middle of a lot of wars. Um, and the best antidote for, for, for this and to try and get things back on track in terms of eradication of poverty, uh, looking at the environmental challenges, is the social and solidarity economy. As I always say, it's the world's best kept secret. Now, in order to do that, there are certain pieces of the puzzle that are important to make this a global response on SSE. What we have is the European Union and through the European Commission driving a very uh, uh, in-depth track on the social and solidarity economy, which is extremely laudable. I mean, we've heard from France, we've heard from Spain, the European countries, and the examples that we get through the OECD as well is, is a very solid drive on, on the social and solidarity economy. But if you look at the developing world and the fragile states, they are completely uh, almost out of the equation on this topic. We may talk about it in bits and pieces. So it's important that at the global level, we get the pieces of the puzzle that are missing and put them into place. One of these pieces of the puzzle is a UN resolution. Many governments have spoken about it in the past and it is for governments to table it, not for the UN itself. And so in the UN task force, we've been working very closely with Pact for Impact with the French government. We've been working with the Spanish government and a number of other governments in analyzing how we can do this and when we can put it on the table. So for the past two to three years, there have been many discussions in this regard, but we're hoping that this year we can get it on the General Assembly agenda in September. So what we've done from a technical point of view is to draft what we think would be some key elements of such a resolution. And the governments are now looking at this draft. Uh, we've had some workshops, we're going to have some more workshops, and then governments need to decide whether this is something that they want to drive. And we certainly have had a positive response, particularly the support from the French and Spanish governments, and we're grateful for that in leading this process and these discussions. So what will happen now is the governments will involve their ministers of foreign affairs in New York, we will look at finalizing a draft content of the resolution and then hopefully get this on the agenda um, by July to be discussed in September. If we miss this here in terms of these processes, because there's very fine timelines, then one's got to go and uh, look at putting it on the agenda next year. So now there's a lot of lobbying, as many governments as we can get to support it, and we do have many. Uh, I've just mentioned two, but there's many African, Latin American and Asian countries like South Korea, Costa Rica, Argentina, Mexico, South Africa, Tunisia, Senegal, and so I can go on. These countries are all very excited about such a process, but it does mean that there has to be a formal compliance of putting this on the agenda and a very specific process that has to be followed. So what we're doing now with our office of, with the UN office of UNDESA is to work with the governments and their foreign affairs departments to put this on the agenda. The advantage of having this done is that we now bring it to the attention of far more governments in terms of what we should do to get a regulatory framework. We need to mainstream this into discussions in countries and not have it playing on the periphery. We need to have an enabling space for social enterprises like many people who are listening in so that we can have more social enterprises. Um, so that's where we stand at the moment. In addition, and the last piece of the puzzle is we've never had a global debate on this. And so at the ILC, which is the International Labor Conference starting in two weeks time, 
we've got a global debate on the social and solidarity economy, looking at a, a, a whether we should have a global definition, what the role of the social economy should be playing and how we can increase this. And so we will also get that piece of the puzzle in place. So that is where we are at the moment. And it's great to work with the many people who are on screen in trying to put this together. Thank you. Thank you, Vic. What can we do as Catalyst uh, members to support this? Keep doing exactly what you're doing as Catalyst, because what Catalyst brings to the party is an amazing creativity and energy and social entrepreneurs that are showing, uh, uh, showcasing how it can be done. And what we need is that energy to be continued so that we can help roll that out to the areas where we don't have successes. And Catalyst have got this footprint that is going globally as well. And so the many Catalyst people in the countries, the developing and the uh, um, fragile economies, they are going to be so key to the rollout in this equation to be part of a national social dialogue. So um, just keep doing the same and keep that energy is what we require. I mean, Jeru's energy just rubs off on everyone and we need to keep that going. Okay, so the message is quite clear. I think we all understand that uh, uh, we all need to act at our own levels and, and especially if we are, as you said, in fragile countries, uh, we must really push our own governments uh, to take action. So I think that's that's a clear message. Um, maybe going back to, to Spain, and you just mentioned, both Vic and Thomas mentioned that Spain was an active member of, uh, of the Pact for Impact Alliance. You're also, I think, supporting the, the resolution. Uh, how does your government intend to Maravillas to contribute to the different challenges ahead on the international scene, such as this UN resolution? Uh, you're still muted, Maravillas. Disculpa. <laughs> A ver, eh, no, creo que tanto eh, Big Bang Buren como Tomás eh, han, han explicado perfectamente en qué punto estamos. Eh, desde el primer momento en que en el Ministerio de Trabajo y Economía Social asumimos este compromiso, eh, formaba parte de nuestras políticas públicas de impulso de la economía social, llevar a cabo una agenda internacional muy intensa y estamos participando en todos los grupos de trabajo y en todas las hojas de ruta dirigidas a movilizar en este sentido esa parte más internacional que tiene el movimiento de la economía social, que es un movimiento global. Es difícil expresarlo mejor que, que lo ha hecho Vic Van Buren. Eh, entonces, desde, no, desde nuestro ministerio lo que estamos haciendo es trabajar junto al Ministerio de, de Asuntos Exteriores. Hemos movilizado a nuestro embajador en Nueva York en, en la misma línea que, que se ha hecho por parte de Francia y seguimos avanzando y gestionando todo el procedimiento para, para avanzar de manera aliada con otros estados. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Maravillas. I see more comments uh, and support in the chat and thank you for that. I also see questions around how we can see a list of the countries uh, currently supporting the resolution um, and uh, I'm sure we can provide this uh, maybe not just now uh, but through for instance uh, the Pact for Impact Alliance um, and if you want to write to to the secretariat uh, I know that uh, uh, you will get an answer and maybe a list of the countries that are currently supporting the resolution uh, maybe we can also do that um, we have about 20 minutes left and I would now like to shift the conversation a little bit towards actually the second part, and, and I'm turning back to Francois for that, uh, the second part of your report, uh, we've talked a, a great deal about being a, uh, a comprehensive and enabling, enabling uh, uh, um, regulatory framework. Uh, we all understand that. Uh, but in your report, Francois, I understand that there's another part. And, uh, also, since you took over the, the, the management of the Schwab Foundation for Social Entrepreneurs, I, I think you've carried out a, a great work so that the social and solidarity economy is recognized uh, at its, uh, for its true value. And this year, correct me if I'm wrong, but for the first time uh, in the history of the World Economic Forum, social entrepreneurs will have a seat at the table uh, 
of world economic and political leaders at the, at the Davos summit. So the question is, to what extent that does this progress make it possible to foresee a shift uh, to leverage the potential of social economy to transform mainstream economies? Uh, merci, Fred, and thanks to all the other uh, panelists here, I think, for all of their work, I think, for many years. Uh, very quickly, just to clarify, uh, social entrepreneurs have been coming to Davos for 20 years. Um, and uh, this this year is the largest, so it's the largest showing. So, you know, 50 social entrepreneurs yeah. alongside about, what, 200 government figures and 1,300 CEOs. So it's, it's, it's actually a significant... A presence, uh, but it's the first time that the social economy as a topic will actually be on the agenda. Uh, and so that's mm -hmm. uh, relevant because it's a mainstream agenda. It's not an agenda where we're talking only about the social economy. And I think that's the relevance here is to start kind of recognizing that this is not something people can ignore. You know, if, if Vic calls it the best kept secret, the question is why, you know, why is it still a secret? Why aren't we talking more about it? And I think that's the platform of course, we're providing to, to all of you and, and the work collectively, because I think what's happening, as you said, at the country level is critical, but uh, often, I mean, I know having done this and worked on, 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 on the kind of green papers of the social economy in South Africa in my day, and Vic knows this as well, you know, it requires the international recognition for the local actors to kind of have that legitimacy to do that work. Um, so I, I Everyone has said this is a really important time, it's a really important year, and I think the, the, the role of capitalists and social entrepreneurs as part of all these other institutions, we're all trying to play our role. That's to get you know, recognition and investment and regulation to do what we want to do more of. But what we recognize, even that might not be enough, right, to actually get the world we want to see. This is, isn't only about the social economy for the social economy's sake. This is about the fact that we have a collective future that is, you know, in, in dire need of attention, right? And, and you know, clearly we're on a burning planet. We have growing inequality in many ways. We have digital and green transitions that are going to be, you know, pro most likely driving inequality further, at least in an unequal way in many parts of the world. So we really need to look at what is the social economy and its actors and its models provide the mainstream economy, right? And how do we start to shift that world from, from what, this sector offers. And so there's a translation work we need to do. There's a partnership set of work we need to do. Uh, there is this deep, deep work on impact that's been done. There are models around inclusive uh, jobs, inclusive business. There are different ways of understanding value that obviously many people are working on around the world, but the social economy really has something to offer. And so positioning it as part of the mainstream economy, as opposed to something separate or alternate, I think is the job we, we we have to do, you know, and figure out the on ramps. And I think, you know, the uh, our work is just starting to to point in that direction. I think it's the foundational step. Get recognition for what it is and what its potential can be. But part of that potential needs to also be influencing uh, the mainstream. And and I think that mainstream is starting to get ready for it. There are lots of interesting and more radical ways of thinking uh, that the social economy really brings. Uh, I think it's a journey, but it's one we need to, to do together. Indeed, thank you, Francois. Ankucha, I would like to ask you, um, one of the many activities that you have is, is also that you're the president of uh, Ateliere Fara Fontiere, uh, which is a, uh, an integration through economic activity uh, uh, organization in Romania. You do work a lot with the private sector, uh, in your experience, how does the work of an organization such as Afefe uh, bring about change uh, in, in, in some of the private partners that you work with? Do you see a shift? Do you think your, your work uh, actually influences those, those private organizations that you work with that finance uh, Afefe? Yes, uh, more and more. And of course, uh, Afefe is a pioneer in circular economy in Romania. As a small social enterprise, we are uh, driving, in a sense, uh, new models of, uh, of enterprises. And more and more, of course, our partners understand uh, this shift in our relationship from uh, just a recipient of corporate sponsorship to, uh, a, a, let's say, a service or product provider with, with, a, the, with a, both our reuse workshops, 
Um, and uh, I think, uh, you know, we work with uh, tens of companies and um, uh, yes, it's a new relationship, it's evolving, it's a, uh, uh, also a mind shift for all of us, even in the nonprofit sector, there is resistance in adopting entrepreneurial models. And we have to admit that there is, um, there are challenges, not just in working with companies, but within the nonprofit sector itself uh, sometimes. So yes, uh, times are uh, interesting here. Indeed, thank you. Thank you, Akuchita. I would now like to, to take whatever time we have left uh, to take some questions and comments. And I see here in the chat, for instance, an interesting comment uh, about what's happening or what happened in Australia. Uh, and I don't know if the person who, who made the comment is still with us because I can't see everyone. But apparently the, the framework uh, in Australia where tenders from all governments and agencies require tenderers to spend a percentage with social enterprises has created an interesting problem uh, where there is now more demand for goods and services from social enterprises. So it's, it's good news, obviously, because it's working, but it's also creating tension. Um, so how do we make sure that our policies actually do not create too much tension on those on those uh, social enterprises? I don't know if anyone wants to 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 react on this, but I figured that it was an interesting uh, comment. And if the person is here, uh, please raise your hand and don't hesitate to uh, to speak. That's so I brought that up. It's um, it's a good problem to have. <laughs> and it is really driving the social enterprise sector in Victoria. And it's being picked up by other states and local government networks around Australia and getting a lot of inquiries from other countries about the model. So it's quite, quite encouraging. And the Victoria government was one of the shortlists for the um, Catalyst Awards. Thank you for this. Uh, there was also a question for you, Thomas, but I don't know if you'll feel comfortable uh, answering it because it's kind of political and being a civil servant yourself, you, I don't know if you, if you want to, uh, to say that, but uh, to, to answer that, but the, the, the question was around France, uh, uh, what France is evolving into knowing the major challenges that the country faces socially economically and ecologically. Um, yeah, the person is curious to, to, to know how you see actually France evolving into in, in this respect. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. actually, uh, I, I will sort of make an echo to another question, which is just now uh, being uh, launched into the chat about the, let's say, uh, uh, virtue, intrinsic virtue of the SSE as a, a natural builder of, let's say, democratic uh, um, constructions and institutions. And I will respond to the question that, 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 that in, in the very easy way, France is a pillar of very ancient history and SSE is part actually of this history. And I think it, it forms also the basis for the foundations for, for building a democratic system. I mean, it organizes debates, it creates dialogues, it makes interactions with many different uh, sectors. Uh, SSE is not only social, it's, it's very, very uh, diversified, very multidisciplinary. So I will not, of course, make a, a, a response focused on the uh, current political situation. Uh, everybody knows that uh, we have to have our own debates, and this is not about this, that uh, I think uh, SSE is addressing the, the, the challenges of, 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 of nowadays. I think it addresses the risk that we lose, I mean, our uh, uh, democratic foundations. And I think this is the uh, antidote, actually, one of the antidotes, of course. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, another comment in the chat, uh, interesting also, uh, I find interesting that social economy apparently is connected at the public level with labor, the case of Spain, for instance, and why social economy is being connected with labor, uh, more with labor than with economic development or industry. Um, but actually, uh, in France, it is connected uh, with uh, economy, finance, and recovery at the moment. So we can see here that there are different approaches. What I think uh, is important that it is, is that it exists 
at government level and that it is being recognized uh, again as an important uh, sector, but it's an interesting comment. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if you want, anyone wants uh, in, in the, from the panel wants to comment on this. Um, for social entrepreneurs and their funders, also question in the chat. Um, someone is asking uh, if there's a place where we can find learnings from other innovative social enterprises um, as uh, he or she finds that most times we end up reinventing the wheel and thereby not making the kind of impact we could. Uh, I think, Francois, you could react to this uh, since the the Schwab Foundation has actually opened up uh, for the two, the last two or three years to new types of awardees, including uh, academics. And uh, do you think that the world, the, the, the work of academics can help actually uh, do a better, uh, help study the, 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 uh, the, the social enterprises that, that work and help maybe spread uh, those concepts? Uh, because I do believe, and correct me again if I'm wrong, that uh, contrary to say the world of uh, of uh, of technology, where uh, innovations are kept uh, 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 and are being protected, in our world of social and uh, enterprise and social innovation, uh, we actually want to spread the, the best ideas. So, how does the the Schwab Foundation uh, help in again? Uh, 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 disseminating the, 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 the best ideas and, and, and concepts. Thanks, Fred. I mean, I think I'll speak about universities and the role of academia more broadly uh, than just us having uh, been a recovered academic myself. Uh, so the, the, I think the key role, I think many people who've seen the sector evolve, uh, academia has played a really important um, analytical role and legitimizing role of what the sector has done from you know no recognition because essentially this sector has emerged almost organically you know it wasn't a public investment that said we need to invest in this industry and get there it's, it's really emerged bottom up and I think academia has played a really important role in giving that um, a, a mirror and a reflection actually for actors themselves to think about what is it that we're actually doing? How do we learn from others? But they're also important platforms for debate around things like democracy, around things like policy making, uh, and also for a wider understanding for the next generation who clearly have an appetite for working in these kinds of ways. Uh, so they play really, I think, important roles as part of this ecosystem. Um, and the other thing which reflects back to, I think, a part of the previous conversation was that because it is so contextual and local in many ways, it isn't the same thing in every country. And I think we need to acknowledge that um, and recognize uh, that, as we said, in some countries, it may be linked to, to labor departments. Other countries, it may be linked to trade and industry. In other countries, it might be called the impact economy. In other countries, it may be part of SME development. That, and I think in our research, we've kind of recognized there is a great heterogeneity, and that's okay. I think having some momentum around the social economy as we have this year is a really good thing, the UN resolution, but then recognize when it comes to country level, you know, finding what actually works, what are the plans of that country and integrating into those plans and finding the right economic drivers and finding the right public sector drivers who want to achieve those goals means that it will look very different in different places. Thank you very much, Francois. I think Vic, uh, you raise your hand. You also wanted to come. Uh, just you know, on the on the comment about where do you find these best practices and what what is there, I think that's something we've got to improve on. Um, within the UN task force, we've created a knowledge hub, um, but I think it might be too academic. It, there's a lot of research papers on this knowledge hub, but what we've got to do is up our game in putting out more best practice scenarios on these different knowledge hubs. So within the task force, we're certainly going to try and create a space on our, we have a United Nations Task Force website that's easily accessible, and there's a link to the Knowledge Hub. So one can find a lot of information there. But I do think that we need to somehow find a way of, of, um, of showcasing the best practices, of, particularly of the, the social entrepreneurs, because that's going to show particularly the youth of what can be achieved. And the youth are becoming more and more interested in this topic. 
And that's one of the failures that we have is that our branding of the social economy and the showcasing of best practices is not up to scratch. And we need to, to spend some time fixing that up. Thank you. Thank you, Vic. Thank you very much. Um, maybe a last question. We have three minutes left. Uh, I think all five of you uh, were at, Stras at the Strasbourg uh, summit last week. Um, and I heard that it was, I wasn't able to, to, to come, but I heard that it was very interesting and, and, and good, uh, good energy. What came out of it, particularly with regard to the consideration and promotion of the SSC uh, at European level and, 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 and from its members, and also maybe the connection between, between local and international levels? Uh, maybe Ankucha, you would like to, to comment on this? Uh, I'm not sure something very uh, concrete uh, came out, but uh, there was, of course, a lot of commitment to the uh, European Social Economy Plan, uh, which was really uh, proved to be not just a political uh, document statement, but really with a lot of concrete intentions. And um, the, uh, the commissioner and all the... Uh, the uh, institutions present really proved to be ready for its implementation and to make what uh, Francois was say, saying earlier, this provide this recognition to the sector, to the social and solidarity economy sector as uh, a, a sector in itself of the economy, not just this uh, auxiliary or how to call it, uh, uh, sector. So um, yes, uh, I I am optimistic after uh, I, seeing that uh, there is a will to move forward with um, and of course moving towards the broader concept and uh, uh, reviving and uh, uh, keeping uh, the tradition of uh, solidarity economy, which means also its democratic values and the membership base. And so this real clarity that the Social Economy Action Plan has brought makes me optimistic that uh, we are heading in the right direction. And that's a great way to conclude this panel. Thank you very much, everyone. We're now reaching the top of the hour. I would like to really thank our five panelists and everyone for attending. I think we have a very clear call to action uh, towards obviously supporting um, uh, this UN resolution, and, and please, if you want to, to get involved somehow, contact Catalyst 2030, contact either Pact for, uh, Pact for Impact Alliance, uh, and I'm sure we've put the, 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 um, the, the website address uh, in the chat, uh, and if you need uh, support uh, to push your own governments, we're all happy to do that. Uh, please stay tuned for the, the next uh, session of uh, Catalyzing Change Week, uh, Shifting the Global Narrative. And uh, you have a very good day, evening, uh, morning, whatever. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, Fred. Nice to see everyone in the audience here, too. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Goodbye.